Welcome to Halting Toward Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Ettinger and Brian Broom, and today we are talking about the day of small things. We talked last week about, or two weeks ago, depending on when you're listening to this episode, um, we talked about the restoration of worship in what we call the Restoration Era with uh, Ezra and Nehemiah, etc., coming back from Babylon to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple and the walls. This was uh, the uh, completed foundation slab was kind of a disappointment, apparently, <laughs> to the people of Israel, at least the old people who had seen what had been before. Uh, Greg, would you read for us the the passage where it talks about the mingling of the weeping and the yeah. joy? Uh now, in the second year of their coming into the house of God in Jerusalem, in the second month begins Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, Joshua, the son of Josedek, and the remnant of their brethren, the priests, and the Levites, and all they that were come out of the captivity unto Jerusalem, and appointed the Levites from twenty years old and upward, to set forward the work of the house of the Lord. Then stood Joshua with his sons and his brethren, Cadmiel, and his sons, the sons of Judah, together to set forward the workmen in the house of God, the sons of Hinnadad with their sons, and the brother of the Levites. And when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, they set the priests in their apparel with trumpets, and the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with cymbals to praise the Lord after the ordinance of David, king of Israel. And they sang together by course in praising and giving thanks unto the Lord, because he's good for his mercy and doeth forever toward Israel. And all the people shouted with a great shout, when they praised the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. But many of the priests and Levites and chief of the fathers who were ancient men that had seen the first house, when the foundation of this house was laid before their eyes, wept with a loud voice. And many shouted aloud for joy, so that the people could not discern the noise of the shout of joy from the noise of the weeping of the people. For the people shouted with a loud shout, and the noise was heard afar off. A little simple story. Ever Have you all ever seen a foundation slab of, of something you were looking forward to see the completion of? The neighborhood across the street from my house when I was growing up was being built mm -hmm. uh, while I lived there. So we used to go and walk through the partially completed buildings and... Oh, they looked a lot bigger once they were done. <laughs> it was a pretty fancy neighborhood, but the the raw foundation didn't look that big. Ryan, do you have any such experience? No. Oh. Um, <laughs> I mean, there's always been stuff being built. I mean, I, I grew up in California, so like <laughs> there's just constantly been things expanding mm -hmm. and being built. But I can't recall a time seeing a, an actual foundation slab being laid or seeing it. I mean, that's actually that may not be true. I may have seen a department store one, but those are not exactly feats of engineering. <laughs> it's a box. <laughs> More generally, though, I feel like when you're planning a party and you're thinking about all the individual components, it's like, well, mm -hmm. what's a few streamers, you know, a few candles, mm -hmm. a, a few, you know, songs on mm -hmm. the playlist. And it comes together much more magnificently than any of the component parts. The the whole is greater than the parts. Yeah. I remember when we were living in our previous house and there's a, a Walmart over the wall and around the corner and across the uh, the very busy street. And but in between on our side of that very busy street there was this random corner that was very empty. And had been empty since, you know, the creation of the world or the flood or something. <laughs> and one day we saw that the heavy equipment was clearing it out. And, and then we saw the basic two-by-fours put in for laying concrete and then the concrete slabs. And as this was happening, my, my girls were still fairly young at the time. And we, we all as a family looked at this and said, what are, what are they thinking here? There's no room there. That's just this very small piece of land. What could possibly go there? Even if they get buildings, where are people going to park? 
And, but as we watched it come together and we saw the foundation, well, the foundation slab still did not convince us. Okay, those are tiny. What kind of building is that? That's nothing. Then the walls went up. Then the asphalt went in. And suddenly we had two smallish, but nonetheless true, strip malls <laughs> with ample parking for both of them. And then some, like, how'd that happen? That's magic. Mm -hmm. um, when I wrote the original article for this, I, I, I found some a lady named Kate, no relation, <laughs> who was posting on gardenweb.com and she said, so did your house look smaller at this stage? It can't just be me, can it? So apparently it's a much larger phenomenon than one might think. But there's more to it than that. The found In this case, when the Temple's Foundation slab was laid, there were people who remembered the complete structure. And the complete structure of Solomon's Temple was not just the, the temple proper. It was the courtyard and the other courts that adjoined that and the king's palace, which was interlaced with it. There was a lot, just a lot of stuff. And of course, it was built up and it was glamorous. There was gold everywhere, polished stones, gemstones, glittering, glistening in the sun, the two big pillars out front, um, huge altar that you could climb up and walk around on top of all of the, 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 the brazen sea. And as they looked, they saw it's a slab of concrete. Well, it probably wasn't concrete, but it's a it's a <laughs> it's a foundation slab. And they were decidedly under enthusiastic about this. They were they were depressed. It was like this is not this is not what we remember. And and on top of that, the prophets Isaiah, Micah, Ezekiel had spoken of the glories of the temple in the latter day, when it would be exalted above the hills and all nations would flow unto it, and a river of water of life would flow out in all directions, and all, all it just it was going to, Ezekiel spent like nine chapters talking about the Restoration Temple. And this wasn't it. And so when you, 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 you're, you have the spiritual enthusiasm for God being on the move, and God's going to do something great. You know, you're going to you're going to start a new church plant, or you're going to open your little Christian school, or your mission, or you're going to do your you're going to canvas the neighborhood and get a lot of people to come for your special service, and two people show up. Um, one's a granny, and one's you know some nine year old kid. Where's the greatness of God? It's very easy to think that God's failed. God doesn't really do stuff in history, not in my history, not in my life. On the other hand, there were people there who had grown up in, in captivity in Babylon, and they'd heard about what it was like to be back home in Israel and all of God's great acts and how God always kept providing for his people and God was, always had a plan and was always pushing it forward. And they're there like, we have a temple. Well, we have a foundation slab. This is so great. Yay. And so is the prophet. As Ezra tells us, we have people shouting for joy and people moaning and weeping just as loud so that at some distance you couldn't even tell what was going on. It was just noise. And, and so it's in this context that both Haggai and Zechariah, who were two prophets who began ministry about this time, come to Israel, come to the remnant and say, let's talk about small things. So that's what we're going to look at just a little bit, and then some thoughts about how God does things today and what, what small things might look like and what we might do and not do about them. So... Um, oh, one more uh, yeah. illustration. Mm -hmm. The custom of um, photography when you're selling a home. Mm. You don't take pictures of empty rooms because they don't look as big as a right. room with something in it. Yeah. Yes, and you, but you do take a picture as far back in a corner <laughs> as you yeah. possibly can. And I'm suspecting you're doing something with the lenses because I've looked at pictures of houses <laughs> where I know the house well. Yeah. And I'm saying, <laughs> that room is not that big. <laughs> how, how did they get that picture? I mean, I, I see all the features of the room that I know well. They must have been standing on a ladder in the very top back corner and mm -hmm. done some kind of panorama thing because... People, when they go to see the house, are going to be surprised. It's not that big. <laughs> now, you know, once you start living in it, it's amazing how big rooms are because now <laughs> you have to clean them. Yeah. <laughs> that makes that makes any room a whole lot bigger. You have to clean it. Now it's big. 
but uh, yeah, it's that that whole thing is amusing. <laughs> Here is what Haggai says to Zerubbabel and Joshua and the people of his time. He says, "Who is left among you?" that saw this house in her first glory. And how do you see it now? Is it not in your eyes in comparison of it as nothing? But yet, yet now be strong, O Zerubbabel, saith the Lord, and be strong, O Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, and be strong, all ye people of the land, saith the Lord, and work. For I am with you, saith the Lord of hosts. According to the word that I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, so my spirit remaineth among you. Fear ye not. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, Yet once in this a little while, and I will shake the heavens, and the earth, and the sea, and the dry land, and I will shake all nations, and the desire of all nations shall come. And I will fill this house with glory, saith the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, saith the Lord of hosts. The glory of this latter house shall be greater than the former, saith the Lord of hosts. And in this place will I give peace, saith the Lord of hosts. Well, first of all, Haggai, this is chapter 2 of Haggai's prophecy. Haggai recognizes what's going on. He calls the spade a spade. Okay, you people are pretty upset, aren't you? Yeah, got that. This thing seems like nothing compared to what you remember. Well, be strong and work. There, some more theologies are going to follow, but the bottom line, the application, the use, as the Puritans would call in their sermons, <laughs> comes right up front. It's one word, work. But it's so pitiful. Yeah, get to work. If you want to just stop being looking pitiful, you need to put in some elbow grease. You need some energy. You need some prayers. You need some contribution of your own resources, some money out of your own pocket, some time off your own clock. There's stuff that has to be done. Now, he had no point does he say, and if you do that, then this will be just like Solomon's temple and even better. What he says is a little more subtle than that, and it's important that we look at that. But the, the one thing that he does say, well, be strong and work. So when we look at the impossible situation, when we look at diminishing returns, when we look at, wow, we invested a lot in this and we really didn't get much in return, okay, well, work. There, there's nothing here about after a time of depression, after a time of wringing your hands, after a time of sobbing and bitterness, then, no, it's just, okay, look, get, get, just get to work. But then he, he says something else. He reminds him of his covenant promises. According to the word that I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, so my spirit remaineth among you, fear ye not. We're going to see that Zechariah 2 highlights, underlines the work of the Holy Spirit. And, and, and then he drops into some very profound theology. And it's, it's, it's huge enough that the writer of Hebrews picks this up at the tail end of chapter 12. It's a little while, and I'm going to shake heaven and earth and the sea and the dry land. I'm going to shake all nations, and the desire of all nations shall come, and I will fill this house with glory. This is not something they do. Mm -hmm. Their job is real simple. Work with what you have on what you got. God's job is to, through his providence, through carrying out his eternal decrees, is to shake up the universe by covenant transformation and introduce a brand new era that centers around what he calls the desire of nations, the glory of this house, and peace. In other words, the gospel, the coming of Christ into the world. They can't do that. They can't bring it about. They cannot hasten it. They can become vehicles for God to do whatever God's going to do, but he really hasn't laid out the plan, and, and he doesn't give them a timeline. You know, if you get this temple up and running in 10 years, that will bring Messiah's appearance 100 years closer. There's none of that. It's just, you, here's the job. I'm in charge of the final results. And this is part of a plan that is cosmic in scope, in the most literal sense of a word. I'm shaking heaven and earth. I'm transforming everything. The very way you approach me and the way you know me is going to be transformed by what's coming. And this little thing that you've started is going to play a part in that. I'm not going to explain what that part is a whole lot, except in this 
Geographical location. I'm going to give peace. And you can see lots of hands going up. Like, when? How? <laughs> How long? What, what's that going to look like? What can else you give us we... a timeline for our yeah. subcommittee to get things yeah. in order? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. All of the things that we would want to do. And, and, and he doesn't. Uh, he does say, look, you're worried about your expenses, the gold and silver in mine, in this process of shaking the nations. I can shake out some gold and silver in your direction. I'll, I'll, I'll make sure your bills are paid. Sometimes we forget this. There's one pastor, I don't remember what it was. It might have been Moody or Spurgeon or just some unnamed pastor of that era. But he was uh, looking at the financial needs of, of their congregation or their, their current mission activity. And down on his knees, he said, Lord, I know you own the cattle on a thousand hills. Would you mind selling some of them and sending us the money? <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes we forget that God really does have the money and that he's in charge of it and that he can shake up the universe and bring it to us when he wants to. But part yeah. of the point is we, we we're far too dependent upon money. We think that we have to have this, we have to have that. This temple is the ritual center of the universe. It's where God meets with man, and God's not in a big deal in a big hurry to spend a lot of money on it. Yeah, the king, mm -hmm. Cyrus had given them some money, most of which they wasted because they didn't follow through. They come up with some more of their own money. Darius, the next emperor, sends them some more along. Pagan emperors funding the temple? What? Didn't see that one coming. <laughs> so God will bring it when it's necessary, but he doesn't even tell them to go out and start a capital campaign. He just <laughs> tells them to work. Whatever, whatever is there in front of you, whatever your current job is, do that. And, and then God can arrange things. He, he owns the universe. He owns all the gold and silver. And he can pull it all together. And he's going to because this... And this is what's been important about this temple all along. They, they missed everything. Solomon kind of got it. God does not dwell in a temple made with hands. It's just a place we're going to pray toward because it's symbolic of God's promise, yada, yada. What they didn't get is, yeah, and the Messiah, the incarnate Son of God, is going to stand on the steps of this porch and announce himself as Yahweh in the flesh. Nobody got that. Nobody <laughs> understood they all knew this was important. They had no idea why or how imbibed with the, the, the pagan philosophies of the world. You know, objects and idols and talisman, these things can be very important and channel cosmic power. Yeah, not in God's economy, they don't. God, God works through very simple means. We'll, we'll talk maybe a little more about that. Uh, the next prophet to weigh in is Zechariah. And this is Zechariah 4, and this is this is a more difficult prophecy, but he says many of the same things from a different angle. It goes like this, chapter 4. The angel that talked with me came again and waked me, as a man that's waked out of his sleep, and said unto me, What seest thou? And I said, I've looked, and behold, a candlestick, or more accurately, a lampstand, all of gold with a bowl upon the top of it, and his seven lamps thereon, and seven pipes to the seven lamps, which are upon the top of it, and two olive trees by it, one on the right side of the bowl and the other on the left side thereof. So I answered and spake to the angel that talked with me, saying, What are these, my lord? Then the angel that talked with me answered and said unto me, Knowest thou not what these be? And I said, No. My Lord. <laughs> That's why I asked. <laughs> <laughs> then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might nor by power, but, my, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Who art thou, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel thou shalt become a plain, and he shall bring forth the headstone thereof with shoutings, crying, Grace, grace unto it. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, The hand of Zerubbabel, the hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. His hands shall also finish it, and thou shalt know what the Lord of hosts has sent me unto you. For who hath despised the day of small things? For they shall rejoice and shall see the plummet of the hand of Zerubbabel with those seven. They are the eyes of the Lord which run to and fro throughout the whole earth. And then I answered and said unto him, <clears throat> What are these two olive trees upon the right side of the lampstand and upon the left side thereof? And I answered again and said unto him, And what be these to olive branches, which through the two golden pipes empty the golden oil out of themselves. And he answered me and said, Knowest thou not what these be? And I said, No, no my lord. 
And he said, these are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. I like Zechariah. He is so blunt. And, <laughs> and yeah, I know. I don't know what this is. What he sees, uh, I've seen various attempts to render it pictorially or at least to re-describe it in, in, in words so we can we can visualize it. And and I don't know that I've I've got it all nailed down, but the idea, the basic idea is pretty clear. What he sees is the menorah from the temple with seven branches with the lamps. Some have pictured it as maybe a, a collective bowl of oil with seven lamp wicks floating in it. But uh, there seems to the, the the picture seems to be we're talking about the temple, we're talking about worship, and that would be you say seven lamps, that's what they would automatically think of. The rest of the details are a little weird. There are two olive trees, one standing on each side, and they have lowered branches or boughs. And out of these boughs are pipes that lead to a central bowl, and the central bowl feeds the lamps on the menorah. Now, this is not to say this thing really exists or in, in through human engineering could ever exist, but the picture is pretty clear. The trees are there. They're constantly producing olives. Somehow, those olives automatically go from being olives to being olive oil. Smashed. <laughs> yeah, they, they, they are self-smashing, self-coughing um, up oil, which is channeled through their branches and through these pipes to a central bowl. And from that central bowl, the individual lamps are fed. In other words, as long as the olive trees are doing their thing... This menorah's got to be burning. Uh, we might use other descriptions today with the technology we know. We might have a nuclear reactor set on each side of the thing to provide power <laughs> for for light, electric lights or something. But it, it worked for them, and it's using symbols that, that are woven throughout Scripture. Trees, oil, olives, lamps, light, gold, all of that goes into this. And when, when Zechariah says, what is this, the angel, don't you know? No, <laughs> I don't. I wouldn't have. Yeah, no. Could you tell me, please? Have you lived in Jerusalem all this time and have not <laughs> heard of these things? Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, but the answer is not a technical or technological description or even an aesthetic one. It's a promise. This is the word of the Lord by Zerubbabel saying, not by might nor by power but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Remember that when Haggai had referred back to God's covenant faithfulness, he says, my spirit remains with you. Well, we're back to the Holy Spirit again. In other words, the thing that makes the difference between these pathetic outward things that we have, that God has arranged for us to have in his providence, and what God intends to accomplish is not how clever we are, how much money we have, how what a political following we have, what technologies are available, whether or not we have a Death Star or a Starship, a publishing house. Uh, ho do we own Hollywood yet? <laughs> if the rate Disney's going, we could probably buy it cheap. Um, <clears throat> the, the, that's not God's mechanism. The thing that powers and quickens and brings life to God's plans is the person of the Holy Spirit. It's not by might, it's not by power, it's by the power of God's spirit, spiritual power that we can't trace with our eyes or our science or our financial accounting or any such thing. In other words, something that does not make sense to the flesh, something that does not make sense to our practical sense of realism. Well, that's a great dream you have, but you got to have money. How much money did Jesus have when he set out? Mm. Well, that's different. I mean, he was full of the Holy Spirit. Mm-hmm. And he was God. Yeah, wasn't he? Still is, as a matter of fact. Well, but he's in heaven, enthroned at the right hand of the Father. Exactly. He was <laughs> here in his humiliation. <laughs> Constantly. He, he was here in his humiliation. Now he's exalted. You think? And he sent his spirit here for us. Wow, yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> Maybe we're looking for the wrong things, and we're, or we're looking at doing the right things the wrong way. And, and and so the message here, this this, this whole array of trees and, and and lamps and bowls, is simply a message that God works by His Holy Spirit, 
And since the power is God, the goal is God's, the design is God's, the motivation is from God, uh, we really don't have to worry about those things. We're back to work. What has God set in front of you to do? Do that. Do it in prayer, do it in faith, do it in trusting Jesus, do it with the Word of God in your heart, something you're meditating on, but do it. And it may not look like you think it ought to. The foundation slab of this new temple did not look right. And even even uh, 400 years later, 490 years later, when when Jesus came to earth, you know, by that point, it was pretty impressive. Herod had glorified it and rebuilt it and amplified it. And still people weren't completely happy because Herod was not a nice person, not a godly man. So they weren't sure that they were happy with all these changes. <laughs> And there was the time when the Romans nailed up a giant Roman eagle on the building to signify that, yeah, we're, we're watching all of this and we're kind of in charge here. So even then, it lacked perfection. And then let's talk about the people who ran the temple when Jesus came. Oh, yeah. And let's talk about all of the, the animals and the uh, money-changing tables in the courts when Jesus came. It, it never was something that was going to change the world. It was simply a place where Jesus, Jesus could stand up and say, I am the light of the world. Before Abraham was, I am. Come unto me and drink. Out of your innermost being will flow rivers of living water. That's what it was there for. Oh, yes, it pictured lots of things. But as soon as Jesus came, the pictures were fulfilled. And within 40 years, the temple was leveled and never is never going to be rebuilt. Oh, by the way, in passing, the temple will never be rebuilt. Please do not contribute <laughs> to fundraising projects aimed at rebuilding the temple for the Jews. I'm pretty not sure all of the is... money necessary has already been amassed. <laughs> like if it were going to happen, funding is not the problem. Funding is not the problem. But 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 we but what what could we I mean if you've got money isn't that what it's all about well we're back to no it's actually not what it's all about it's about the work of God's spirit and the promise is that God has selected here's something they didn't know this is brand new information God chose Zerubbabel now they don't know why Zerubbabel we'll get back to that in a second but God has chosen Zerubbabel to start the building project and He's chosen to him to finish it Zerubbabel is not a young man at this point. So there's, there is a ticking clock here, but it's a, a ticking clock of encouragement. Well, you know, Zerubbabel might, might, might be 40 or 50. I mean, he's got, you know, 20, 30 years tops left. Well, then that means that this project's going to be done in that length of time, doesn't it? Oh, you yeah. know. Hmm. <laughs> the hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. His hands shall also finish it. Uh, and then he comes back to this, this theme, who hath despised the day of small things? We want to start big and brassy and bright with a huge budget and tons of supporters and a huge mailing list, oh, the most up-to-date technology, computer systems, lights, smoke machines, whatever, <laughs> um, huge choirs, uh, Contemporary instrument. We, we want. We feel that if we have all of these things, one, they're necessary, but they're not only necessary. They are. They are efficient to the goal. We want revival. We want Christian presence. If we have these things that money can buy and time and energy and logical planning, then we'll have what we need, and we're going to change the world. You know, I, I, I'm. It would be interesting to see to do a survey of twentieth now 21st century history, and look at people who had those sorts of plans and managed to pull together the funding and the technology and the mailing list and all the support and see what their project had come to after 10, 20, 30, 40 years. Do we even remember them? How did we even hear of them? What was not the first thing that happened to some of these ministries is they apostatized within five years. Because their focus was not upon Christ and his finished work and the gift of his Holy Spirit. It was upon what we can do, how we can make this work, what assets God needs from us, and how we are so privileged to be able to present them to God. And now at last, because we're here and we're ready, God's going to change the world. And that's not the gospel. And that's not how God works. Going Speaking again of our Lord... 
he didn't have much of a budget. People gave him money. They had a treasurer whose record keeping was not very trustworthy. <laughs> they did not have a seminary building. They did not have um, a curriculum. They did not have books. As far as we can tell, they didn't even have a Bible. They probably most likely, when they came to a town, they would make use of the scrolls that were available in the local synagogue because Bibles were really expensive. Old Testament copies of the Torah and the prophets were very expensive. You wouldn't just walk around with them. But um, they would have memorized it. But least they the would Torah. have memorized a lot yeah. of it, absolutely. So they, they counted on that rather than on having the technological resources of the day. We're not told that maybe maybe someone in the group played a harp or a lute or a, a tambourine. We're not told that they did, and no one makes a big deal about it. Um, how, but how can you have how can you go around as a group of Christian people and not at least have a guitar? <laughs> <laughs> well, it some looks people like, like to sing. <laughs> yeah. There's always Some that one of us guy use who, our imaginations. Yeah. <laughs> There's always that one guy who breaks out a guitar at the campfire, and yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and you know, and, and not that no, that's a bad thing. Not that it's a bad thing, and not that we're not thankful for it. And sometimes that one guy has never had music lessons. Yeah, yeah, so. that's uh, not fun. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, the day of small things, you 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 pick up what you've got. This is a complete tangent, sort well, almost complete, but it, it bears a little bit. As theater director for a school, we, the school, I'm going to have to give tribute to Kathy Rose, who's done a lot of work, particularly for musicals over the years. We never had a whole lot. I mean, she had a pretty good computer mm -hmm. system that she made a lot of use of, and she had boundless energy. <laughs> um, but by and large, as we look at doing any particular play, we didn't... And, and this, I think, is something that a lot of Christian schools may miss. I don't know. I have not, I've not talked enough to know, and even in, and even other venues. We never said, oh, here's a play we want to do. I love this play. It'd be a great play to do. Let's do this play. Now, let's see who wants to be in it, what kind of gifts they might bring. I'm sure we're going to have a lot of people who want to lead. Let's listen to their auditions. And then at the end of it, we will figure out exactly how we're going to make this thing work. We never really did that. We would look first at our students and say, do we have anyone who can play Hamlet? No. <laughs> no. Okay, we're not doing Hamlet. All right, do we have anybody? Do we have one female? Well, actually, two females. One who can sing soprano and one who can sing... I don't know what the mother abbess is, but, you know. Then we can, <laughs> do, sound of, you know, then we can do sound of music. Mm -hmm. Don't you don't you need a guy who can sing? Turns out we didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Not that Christopher Plummer is. Uh, yeah. All you know. that. No, the first time we did it, we we tried all kinds of things, and we finally ended up with a with a young man who could not sing. But you know, Christopher Plummer. I'm thinking of Rex Harrison and um, yeah, and um, my fair lady, my fair lady. <laughs> he, he did oh, an okay. Our guy did an okay job of of um, speak singing. And, and so it was. We 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 looked at what we had and what was within our grasp, and then we used a little imagination and we prayed a lot. <laughs> and God generally blessed our efforts. Sometimes they were fantastic. Sometimes they were just a lot of fun. Uh, but if we had waited until we had all of the pieces to pull this together, we would not have a drama department. Mm -hmm. and, and small analogy, but I think in, in, speaking for Christian education generally, what you want are a couple really good teachers who are well-educated and know the Bible and sound in their theology, and one or two probably ladies who are going to sit in the office and who are really great at managing weird kinds of things that hit them on a daily basis and can figure out how to do it so the teachers can teach. And then you need a handful of families who say, we like what you're doing, count us in. And you get those usually by praying for them. Advertising for customers doesn't always work that well, because sometimes you get them. <laughs> which is to say you get customers, not people dedicated to a vision. And, and these are areas I'm familiar with, but you could talk about this in terms of building a new church or starting some kind of missionary activity. Paul would just simply come to town, go to the local synagogue, preach a couple sermons. People would come up and talk to him and he'd say, hey, I'm doing a Bible study this week. Come and talk to me. We'll, we'll, I'll tell you some more. 
And eventually, mm. somehow from that, he'd lay the roots, the foundations for a new small congregation, which would usually be pretty small. And he'd spend some time investing in them, and then he'd move on and, and trust them to God. That's not how we do things. It's not how my denomination handles missions, and my denomination could honestly learn from Paul a good deal. You know, keep moving, keep teaching, keep preaching, trust it to God. Uh, don't wait till you have uh, one of the opening lines in the original article was from Star Trek V. Why does God need a starship? <laughs> There's a reason that's there. We we too often think that God does, or at least a TV network, or at least a handful of millionaires who are going to give generously. Uh, the first church is met in homes. If they had you, your house has a guest room, <laughs> it's going to be where church is going to meet. Thank you very much for volunteering. If we uh, don't have instruments. Well, we're going to sing a cappello, I guess. We don't have uh, hymn books. Well, fortunately, you've all memorized psalms. We're going to sing those psalms, and maybe someone can write, can modify some to put the name of our Lord in them in New Testament fashion. You know, and just you start where you are, and don't try to dictate to God what this needs to look like. You simply trust God for the solution. Yeah, that's kind of the story of this podcast. Not that you know we're a huge enterprise even now, but you know we started with some very poor mics and <laughs> a little bit of time and very minimal investments in those poor mics chiefly. Yeah. <laughs> and over time we had supporters come up and say, we want to do what you're doing. We want to support you financially. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we didn't initially have our, uh, our option enabled on our distributors website to say, let people support us. We were like, no, this is kind of just the thing we, we would like to do. We feel like the Lord is mm -hmm. blessing this idea in that it's coming together. And then there were people committed to the idea and they wanted to make it better and keep it going. Um, so now, you know, we've we've got better mics. If you started listening to us in the beginning, thank you for sticking with <laughs> us. And you can tell all of our new listeners how much better our sound is now. Um, better editing software, too. And as we first started out, we kind of had this idea. Actually, you and David had the idea because I was just kind of along for the ride. You said, well... Do you mind if we did something like this? Okay, I guess. <laughs> um, but we had a number of our friends kind of come and go, and and some of them learned, I think, quickly that to talk theology in terms of pop culture requires you to be reading the Bible and and reading theology and and such things. And uh, Brian, it was a while before you settled in and became the guy who does a lot <laughs> yeah. of this for us. And I could not be prouder of what the Lord has done in your life, that I can sit here and I can just say, Brian, talk about this. And <laughs> you don't have a seminary education any more than I do, but you have you have dedicated yourself to to learning the Bible and reading books on theology as well as investing in pop culture and, and, and broad <laughs> high culture. So God's created this team. We didn't create it. And what God will do with it, I have no idea. I, I, pray, I pray with some specific things in mind about this, but I'm going to keep them to myself because I don't want to let my my hope uh, for for size or influence or any such thing get in the way of, God, of what God actually wants to do. Whatever he wants to do mm -hmm. is great. In the meantime, I'm having fun, <laughs> and it's an encouragement to me to talk to you people all the time about the things of the Lord. So here we here we are. <laughs> Brian, did you have any thoughts along these lines? I, 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 it feels too broad to, to say what, what comes to mind, which is just anything people do. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, it's very rare that you come across something that needs all the ducks in a row yeah. in order to, to get a start. And in fact, it's, it's normally better when you just start with whatever ducks happen to be in, in a spot. Um, Indeed. And I know about ducks because we've been raising them. Uh, yeah, like, um, I don't know. The first thing that comes to mind is starting a business. It's like you mm, have yes. an idea, you say this is a good idea, and you can really 
paralyze your mobility on that by thinking that you need to have the idea perfected. You have to have the right people from the start, Mm -hmm. you know, that you need to have it all working it like, like a well-oiled machine on day negative 10. Right. Mm -hmm. Instead of just saying, okay, well, let me just hit the ground running with what I have right now and hope that I don't drop it all. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And that, that can be kind of analogous to spiritual things as well. Mm -hmm. Not that spiritual things are a business. We don't want that to be a business. (laughs) (laughs) Or on the other hand, we do want the Holy Spirit involved in our business. And sometimes Mm -hmm. uh, business itself is a very spiritual venture if it's done by faith in Christ and not simply with uh, the ducks we have handy once we, (laughs) you know, stuff them full of um, chemicals and growth hormones and things. (laughs) Well, we should finish the prophecy of of Zechariah, because he turns in and asks about the two trees. Um, from Genesis to Revelation, this idea of two trees, pillars, columns, witnesses, something like that, continues to haunt us in the background. The two trees in the garden, the um, pillar of fire and cloud in the wilderness, the Pillars before Solomon's temple in the book of Revelation, uh, the two witnesses, uh, the two the two men who held up Moses' hands during the battle with, with Amalek. The, the, this idea that God has two sides, two dimensions, two things that hold up and glorify and amplify and, and structure his workings is very important. And they're, they're pictured here as olive trees and as being the, the living source through which the Holy Spirit is working. If the oil is the Holy Spirit, then these trees, which their roots are in the ground, their leaves are wet with the rain from heaven, they're God-powered olive trees. And they are the channels through which the oil comes that keeps the menorah going. The menorah, the lamp, the lampstand. The light is is oil of flame. It's the Holy Spirit caught on fire, sh- radiating light, truth, wisdom, the Word of God, to all it touches. Jesus said, "I'm the light of the world." This is this, the menorah is the background for that. Well, then, what are the two olive trees? And this was Zechariah asked. So, what are these olive trees? What what are these things that God uses, um, which the Spirit takes hold of and keeps on perpetuating? the ministry of revelation and and preaching and worship and the revelation of Christ to the world. What What is that? And, you know, again, the, do you not know what these are? No, my Lord. <laughs> these are the two anointed ones that stand before the God, the Lord of the whole earth, which still lacks explanation, but it's closer. <laughs> two anointed ones. These are the two Christs. These are the two Messiahs. Well, in the context of Zechariah and Ezra and Haggai, the two anointed ones are Zerubbabel and Joshua, the prince and the priest, or more broadly than the two offices that God has established within his people, those who do the ruling and the governing and the directing and the leading and the exercising of, of discipline and admonition that, you know, prod or pull or invite or lay out and say, look, this is the way. And then the priestly dimension, which draws us nigh to God, which ministers grace, which shows us the word of God and leads us in worship. These two things that God institutionalizes in, in the Davidic kingdom, it was the, it was the monarchy and it was the priesthood. And that's why those two pillars stood before the temple. They did not physically support anything, but symbolically, as long as the priesthood and the the Davidic monarchy were there, worship and the prophetic ministry would continue. Within the church, we have the ruling office of elder, and we have the ministry of the word and sacraments. As long as these do what they're supposed to be doing, the life of the church continues. And we can we can look at sometimes at our, our pastors and our elders, especially, and say, you know, these elders don't have seminary education, so they don't read theology much. We can look at our pastors and say, oh, he's a great guy, and he, he preaches the Word of God, but he's got a corny sense of humor, and he can't sing very <laughs> well, and uh, he's told that story five times, and doesn't he know that? And, 
you know, and when we can find all, we can nitpick these people and say, when the revival comes, we'll get really good pastors and elders. You know what? <laughs> oh, no. I don't think so. <laughs> so. Well, if we only had Calvin and Luther, you wouldn't like Calvin and Luther. You really wouldn't no. like Luther. <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't agree with half of what he says. You wouldn't agree with what, half of what he says, and he would tell you in no uncertain terms how he disagreed with you, and he would punctuate it with very colorful metaphors. You know, you, 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 <laughs> I remember somebody talking about Christian art. Yes. And- music and poetry is like, you know, why don't we have any really sound theological Christian songs and art and stuff, you know, on the popular level, not like hymns or something. But part of it is that people who tend to become songwriters are not the type to be elders and teachers, (laughs) you know, (laughs) these are two different types of people. Uh, Often, often so. Um, and whereas I have tremendous respect, I have respect for Luther, obviously. Mm-hmm. I have tremendous respect for Calvin. But the idea that you walk into his preaching service in Geneva and magic happened <laughs> does not bear up well under historical research. <laughs> no way. Um, it's, he was, uh, uh, he called himself a timid scholar who got roped into doing God's work and then committed yeah, himself to it. He didn't want to be there. He, he was not excited there. about it. No. And, you know, people firing guns under his window and sticking okay. their dogs on him. So it was not It was not the greatest gig going on. But God used it. G- Geneva was, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and so sometimes we need to look at, at our men and just say, thank God you gave us somebody, because the alternative might very well be nobody. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for years now in our church, I've been trying to encourage the next generation to get ready for church leadership, and it has been an uphill struggle. And some of the young men we looked at have moved away. Some for for good reasons. They, their business called them elsewhere. Family commitments called them elsewhere. Some have left for very bad reasons. And yet, these are the people we thought, "Well, oh, you're going to be the next leaders." Oh, you're really not. You have kind of abandoned the faith. Mm-hmm. Wow. Okay. Well, then who's going to do this? And then God brings somebody in out of nowhere, or some. I mean, someone who's been around a long time we never really thought of. Like, oh, Willie, he could do that. But again, no seminary education. Funny thing in passing. This is just me and my maybe somewhat bitter sense of humor. <laughs> we we want our elders to be well-trained, but we kind of assume that since they haven't been to seminary, they shouldn't say too much. You know, I think the issue is how well do you know the Word of God? <laughs> And I have had some of my students sit in on ministerial examinations and come away scratching their head and saying, why was that candidate, that young man out of seminary, so confused over easy questions? And I don't have a polite response to that. Uh, Learning the Word of God is not a hard thing if you're committed to doing it. But it does require work. It requires reading. It requires listening Cutting, shutting up your mouth and listening to what other people who are mm-hmm. older and wiser say and remembering it and taking notes and organizing them. It's a process like learning anything else. Yeah. And sometimes um, trusting the simplicity. Yeah. yeah. Where like, like with anything else, you know, I think people who are very intelligent, you know, intelligence is a gift. It's a wonderful sure. thing, but it can be so distracting Yeah, um, from what the straightforward truth is and you want to figure <laughs> yeah. out all the intricacies so you can figure out your best way, you know, yeah. one of and, my, um, I've seen that too. one of my favorite quotes or, uh, stories from RC Sproul, uh, senior was, he said after shortly after he got converted, uh, he was just in love with reading the word of God. It was just something that gave him energy. He had the focus mm-hmm. for it. It was it was something like it was a spiritual boon flowing out of him. Just he wanted to read the word. And he looked around at some of his his friends that were his age. And he says himself, he's like, I looked at them very pridefully and wondering, well, why why aren't you loving this? This is something, this is God's word. This is this is something that's supposed to be um you know, the very lifeblood of the Christian. And he said, well, one of the things I realized very soon after that was one of the reasons they were having struggles with it is because that wasn't what they were spiritually gifted for, because I had been spiritually gifted to be a teacher. Yes. Mm -hmm. And that's something that 
came naturally to me because of God's gifting. And it wasn't mm. right for me to hold them to my standard by my gifting. That's not the way it works. Yes, and mm-hmm. there's wisdom there to be sure. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. So we start where we are with what we're given. Mm-hmm. We sow the one seed we have. And then we wait to see what in the world God's going to do. And, you know, half the time it's not what we thought. Mm-hmm. And that's okay. And when God says, yeah, that thing that you thought was so important, that wasn't what I was doing it. I wasn't doing it for that reason. I was doing it for this reason and that I'm, I'm done. So you're done. You can go home now. Mm-hmm. You can go do something, move to the next thing. This project, this ministry is done. But no, this has to endure forever. <laughs> you know, it really doesn't. <laughs> there's, there's something else that's going to endure forever. It's not this. No, it's, it's... Speaking of not enduring forever, it's time to wrap up. And All right, there you go. <laughs> go to the recommendation. Excellent segue. Um, listeners, I challenged my friends this evening to come up with a recommendation that had the word little or small or diminutive or something to that effect. Did we succeed? I succeeded. All right, Emily, you go first because we know you have one. Oh, okay. Um, mine is The Little Prince by Antoine de Saint-Exupéry. I don't know how to say his name. It's French. Um, <laughs> but it really rang true. You know, I, I kind of flippantly came up with it because it had the word little in it. But the more we talked, the more I thought, oh, that is really appropriate. Um, in that one of the themes of the book is what gives things value and that it's not the parts of it that you see. The quote is, what is essential is invisible to the eye. Mm. It is only with the heart that one sees truly. And the author of this book is not a Christian, but I'd like to think that you wouldn't (laughs) be able to tell from reading the book. (laughs) Um, I think there's tremendous value in the, the, the theme running through it of how love changes the way you encounter the world, Um, especially you know, reading that with our, with this thought in the background that it's the Holy Spirit who makes things happen, who gives things value, um, who gives us the love for Christ that changes everything we do. It's a tremendously sweet read. Okay. Brian? Mine is not as sweet or necessarily sweet at all. So, <laughs> but uh, one, one of my, I think, I don't know if I'd say it's my favorite movie but it, it's funny uh is little shop of horrors oh <laughs> uh d- questionable content i think is that I the one with the plant is yes there a, yes plant? okay yeah. and actually I don't think so I've i seen it i found out uh at some point uh it was originally a 1950s c movie schlock horror that was horrible <laughs> like it was really bad uh and then in the 80s they revamped it into a stage musical which then got an adaptation to the film starring rick moranis uh and steve martin playing a particularly oh. sadistic dentist <laughs> um but basically guy finds a plant at a store that he doesn't know but it's been beamed from outer space it's actually an alien and the only way it grows is if it consumes blood and at first because the uh main character's love interest thinks it's cute he 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 lets it drink some of his blood from a little finger prick and eventually it grows big enough that it starts asking him for full-grown human bodies (laughs) and uh the, the first victim uh is the sadistic dentist um it's not like there's no deep meaning to this that I could <laughs> I could pull out. Although I tried, I was like, well, you know, it, the, the the plant starts little and it becomes very big, but that's not exactly what we're going for here. Uh, unless we wanted to talk about the uh, sneaking influence of sinfulness, but uh, it's a it's a hilarious movie if you can handle some of the eightiesness of it. <laughs> I had another one, but I I know that that one's not great quantity uh, content wise so <laughs> greg <laughs> um um i deliberately asked brian to go second so that mine would seem e- e- even further away from the uh, the ecstasies of emily's presentation <laughs> there there is a book that anyone who passes through our school has to read 
And its author referred oh, to it is as it the, the little book. The little book. The little book. <laughs> the little book. It's called Elements of Style. Ah, mm -hmm. yes. Originally by Professor Strunk and then added to and edited by E.B. White. It I think we book. all forget that it's called The Elements of Style and we just yeah. refer to it as Strunk and White. Strunk and White, yeah. That is correct. Yeah. <laughs> it is a little book. And even fewer of us remember that it's referred to as The Little Book. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was really stretching on this one. But it, it, but it is a little book and you can read it in an hour or so, but it's it presents the basics of English structuring, of uh, grammar and um, style. And in the process, demonstrates it. It's fun mm -hmm. to read just for the style that these two gentlemen put in to what could easily have been a boring little textbook. <laughs> so if you, if you want to it's polish true. up your English or just see how it's done by Masters of the Craft, Elements of Style by Strunk and White. Splendid. Well, thank you guys so much for this conversation. It's been a pleasure. Uh, thanks also to David, our producer, and my lawfully wedded husband. Thank you to our listeners. We appreciate you tuning in. I think I say that every week, although Greg chastised himself for saying <laughs> tune in. Um, but we appreciate you um, clicking play on the podcast. <laughs> See, it just doesn't have the it same ring. It doesn't work. It doesn't, no. yeah, it doesn't ring. Uh, it's it's kind of like sword versus AK-47. One is much more poetic than the other. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah radio is much more uh, sort of romantic and nostalgic mm -hmm. than podcast. That's true. Yeah. Uh, thanks. Big thank you to our financial supporters. We appreciate you keeping the show rolling, upgrading our equipment, and making everything generally nicer for all the other listeners. <laughs> if you'd like to join their number, you can visit our website, anchor.fm slash halting towards Zion or patreon.com slash halting towards Zion. Uh, if you'd like to send us your recommendation for our upcoming mailbag episode, uh, please do. We'd love to hear from you. Any sort of recommendation. You've heard the nonsense that we recommend. There's no category limitation. Like, you can send us anything. Um, <laughs> we would just love to hear from you um, and uh, get your contributions to the conversation here. Um, our email address is haltingtowardszion at gmail.com. And thanks again for tuning in. There, I said it again. I gotta stop. Um, good night, Gracie. We're done here. <laughs> See you next Gracie. week. <laughs>